Y'all will be starting a lab today, and it will be on something called the ballistic pendulum. And I have one of those set up here. And I like pointing out the historical use of ballistic pendulums. They're not really used today for this purpose because today we have high-speed cameras, and you can actually just use high-speed cameras in the same manner that you'll use the lab to measure the velocities of fired bullets, fired cannonballs, things like that. But dating back to you know the Civil War when they were making weapons for the Union and the Confederate armies, the manufacturers of those weapons had to tell the people buying them what the muzzle velocities of those weapons were. Right? That was just something that, that's information that you want to know um, when you buy a rifle, if you ever do, or a gun. You want to know the muzzle, maybe you don't want to know the muzzle velocity, but enthusiasts do. They want to know how fast, the muzzle velocity is just how fast the bullet is traveling the instant it exits, you know, the barrel of the weapon. So how did they figure that out before? Because they just load gunpowder in and do a round, you know, put the bullet in and then put in the gun and fire it. And like, oh, I wonder how fast that's moving. You know, how did they figure that out? They, they did. They used physics to figure that out using a ballistic pendulum. And essentially, you have a pendulum and you have the thing that's going to shoot it and you shoot the projectile into the pendulum and the pendulum moves up. And just by making measurements of that, of what goes on there, you can actually figure out what the launch velocity of the projectile was. So just to give you an idea, I'm going to load this projectile. So I got the spring loaded. I'm going to use the spring and not gunpowder to fire this projectile for obvious reasons. I'm going to load the projectile. Okay. So when the projectile gets launched, it will embed itself into this guy and it's going to move up. And I can use this device to measure the angle that it's going to move up because when it moves, it's going to move that little black arm that's you know overlaid on a protractor. And then I can measure so I don't have to actually watch it to see how high, high it's going to go. I can just let the, the angle get measured by itself. On the lab, you're just going to superimpose a uh, protractor and then frame by frame go up until it gets to its maximum height and you'll measure that angle. Okay? So it happens fast, obviously. Right? That's it. The experiment's done. The measurements that I can now make are the angle. The angle that it made, I can measure the mass of the pendulum, the mass of the projectile, and then the angle that it makes. And with that information, I can figure out the launch velocity of that projectile. Okay. Um, there are some complications here that I'm going to mention and that we will discuss when we do our rotation unit. When we studied pendulums, we studied simple pendulums. Simple pendulums mean that you're dealing with like string. So here's an old school ballistic pendulum. The color indicates that this was made probably long before you were born, maybe even before I was born. They don't make things that color anymore. Um, but notice that this block, and it's, it's very flimsy, and so it doesn't line up, and so I, that's why I use this one. Much more well made. Um, but you got four strings here. These strings are very light in comparison to the block itself and the projectile. So that acts more like a simple pendulum than this does, because this has a rigid rod that has significant mass connected to it. And just like objects have a resistance to a change in motion due to their inertia, um, objects also have re a resistance to angular motion, and that's called rotational inertia, right? That's why, and you can feel differences in rotational inertia by taking a rod and going like this, and then trying to do it again like this, right? There's a lot more resistance to rotational motion there than there is here, and that's a big part of what we're going to study in the next unit. Um, so this particular ballistic pendulum is more complicated because you would have to factor the rotational inertia of the rod into account whenever you do the physics. We're going to ignore that, though, in this lab. In this lab, we're going to assume it's a simple pendulum. Whether that's a valid assumption or not, you will actually discuss as you go through the lab, um, or at least you'll be discussing experimental errors. However, I will advise you to be careful on that part of the lab, which I'm going to introduce here in a second. So what's going on here? How can I actually use, you know, momentum concepts to figure out what went on um, or to figure out the launch velocity of the projectile? Well, first of all, we have a collision. What type of collision do we have between the projectile and the block that it gets embedded in? Well, the, there's an explosion to launch the projectile, 
a perfectly inelastic collision, right? It's a sticky collision, sticky collision. So they stick together. So because I have a collision, I know I can use momentum concepts, right? To analyze the situation. So let's start from there. Let's just start from there. I know I got a collision. Let's ignore what happens afterwards. Let's just start with, start there. And I, I know that the initial momentum before that collision is equal to the final momentum of the system after the collision. And the system is going to consist here of the projectile and the block that it's going to collide with. What happens after? I can't use momentum, right? Or, or I can't use this particular application of the conservation momentum because something else is going to happen afterwards in response to that collision. Okay. So the initial momentum here, the initial momentum in this system is going to be the mass of the projectile, so I'll put that MP, times the initial velocity of the projectile, which I'll just call V naught. Okay. That is the velocity that the projectile has right before the collision. So this is my before picture. So this is going to be V naught. This will be mass of the projectile. This will be mass of the block. Okay. And then after, my after picture is going to be the block with the projectile in it. And immediately after the collision, it's going to be moving this way. Yes, it's going to arc up. But remember, when we're analyzing collisions, we want to analyze what's happening the instantaneous moment before the collision and the instantaneous moment after the collision. And that, that infinitesimally small moment after the collision, the object will be moving exactly to the right. Okay. And I'm going to call that speed or that velocity V1. I'm going to call it V1 for reasons that you'll see in a second. So I got mass. This is the, this is the total momentum before, right? The block is not moving before, so it has no momentum. But in an inelastic collision, I then have both masses moving together. The mass of the projectile and the mass of the block times that velocity v1. Obviously, it's going to slow down, right? The block bullet with the, the block with the projectile lodged in is not going to be moving as fast as the bullet was or the projectile was before the collision, obviously. And then so I can get an expression for v1, which is our unknown, which is what we want to actually figure out just by dividing both sides of this equation by the total mass. Cancels there. And so V1 is by itself. And so I now have an expression for V1, and that's going to equal mass of the projectile times the initial velocity of the... Oh, wait, no, that's not, that's not what we're looking for, guys. Gosh, I was testing you. You guys all failed. For today. You all get zeros. Even the online learners. They should have. For the record, I'm joking, obviously. What are we actually trying to find here, guys? The initial velocity, the initial velocity of the bullet, V naught. Yeah, that's the whole point here, so I'm sorry. So to do that, I'm going to divide both sides by the mass of the projectile. Now I have an expression for the mass of the projectile. Right? And it, so if I can calculate this, then I can get the initial velocity of the projectile, and that's the whole point. That's what the ballistic pendulum was used for. It's used to determine V naught using physics and not through direct measurement. Okay. What's my problem, though? I don't have V1. I can easily measure the masses, right? I can easily measure those, but I don't know V1. That's what the second part of the motion is for, right? That's why we measure the angle that it goes up. Because what physics concept, probably not momentum, can we use to analyze, essentially, the, to, can we use to relate the speed that it has right here to the height that it then rises? What overall physics concept can we apply? Object changing velocity and changing elevation simultaneously. What do we also have changing simultaneously? As objects change elevation and change speed. Conservation of energy. Exactly. So right after the collision, the system has a speed V1, 
and a kinetic energy associated with that. And then it rises to a maximum height that is read by this little guy here. And at that maximum height, it stops, has no more kinetic energy, so all that kinetic energy has been translated into potential energy, right? So the second, so there's essentially two parts to the ballistic pendulum. You got the first part where you got to apply conservation momentum, the second part where you got to apply conservation of energy, okay? And so when I apply conservation of energy, this is actually my before, right? This is my before, and then at my after is going to be when the block is up here. The block projectile system is up here, right? And at that point, it comes to a stop. At that point, if I'm making my measurements, say, from the center, at that point, I'm at a certain height h above my starting point. And so based on that value of h, I know the potential energy there, potential gravitational energy is mg times h. And I know the kinetic energy here is going to be one half, and really I should say this, the mass is the combined mass of the projectile and the block times g times the height. The kinetic energy is one half mass of the projectile plus the mass of the block times this speed squared, where that speed is the speed it has at the end of the collision, right? So here, again, with these two, I know these two are equal to each other. So when I set those equal to each other, the masses, in fact, cancel out, right? And I can develop an expression for V1, at which point my only unknowns are V0 over here and V1 over here, but that V1 is the same for both. So that's how I can tie those two equations together. I got a system of two equations, and I got two unknowns, so I can solve for both of them, right? <clears throat> you don't need to solve for V1 because you solve this equation over here, the conservation equation for V1. And then you substitute that expression over here and for V1 here, which then allows you to calculate V0. Now, I pointed this out whenever we did this before, and the lab will actually walk you through this, so I'm not going to go through it, the whole thing again. Notice we're measuring the angle. We're not measuring the actual height, right? Um, so you remember how we dealt with that? We just made a right triangle here where we know this distance, you can call it the length of the pendulum. This distance here, you can just call some random value, call it y because it's vertical. And then I can use this angle and this and, and the, yeah, I, I have a triangle here that I can then do some, the lab will walk you through this. I'm not going to go through it all again because I want to give you time to actually do the lab. But I can use some Sokotoa trigonometry to relate that angle. The length here. So that's still the length of the pendulum. And then I can figure out what y is. And then I just subtract y from l. And that will be what h is. The lab, again, will walk you through that. So you don't need to fully understand what that is. But this is the second time we've seen that. It's a very common situation in physics and engineering where you got to figure out a height based on some simple trigonometry like that because very often like here it's a lot easier to measure this angle with this apparatus than it is to measure exactly how high this guy rose right all right so that's our introduction to the ballistic pendulum i will point out a couple things before i set you off on your mission should you choose to accept it you guys ever watch mission impossible Tom Cruise, pretty good movie. Okay, um, so before before I go on though, so access the Ballistic Pendulum Lab on Pivot Interactives. Follow the directions and answer all questions. When answering questions that require written responses, please answer using complete sentences. Numerical results, because some questions are going to say, "What'd you get for the velocity? What'd you get for the mass? What'd you get for blah blah blah." You don't, have to, you don't have to write those in complete sentences. So numerical results need not be written in complete sentences, but the units must be indicated. You will lose points if you don't put units on measure, measured values or any quantity that requires a unit. I'm going to start being a stickler on that. When you have questions that are asking you to describe things, I want complete sentences. Okay, I want punctuation. I want capitalized first, first letters of a sentence. I think that should be basic at this point, but apparently it's not. Um, this lab will count for a major grade, 
It's going to be due tomorrow night. You're going to have all the rest of the period today and tomorrow all period to work on it. Um, yeah. And so it's going to look like this when you hit play. There you go. Right. Um, just follow the directions. See, it's going to walk you through this process. What I am going to really scrutinize as I'm going through and grading this is part three. I'm really going to focus on part three to make sure you're actually thinking about it and not just going through the motions. All right, part three is going to assess whether you're not, whether or not you are actually thinking about what you're doing. Okay. Um, it's going to ask some questions about error. Why are the results? If they're not what you expected, why is your predicted initial velocity for the projectile not the same as what was actually uh, measured directly? Um, and you got to think about it. You got to think about it a little bit. And then part four will actually provide an interesting result here. But just be careful. In part three, I want, I want to see you guys thinking. I want to see you guys thinking. You're going to be analyzing a student response. That's a very common free response question. Student one says this. Student two says this. Which one is correct? What part of their reasoning is correct? Justify your response. Stuff like that. So focus your energy on part three. Part one and two is just kind of going through the motions, doing the physics, and getting your results. Part three is where you're actually going to compare, you know, your theoretical results with the actual measurement. And then part four just kind of says, eh, this might have been the reason why you might have seen a discrepancy if you did. And so the point, the point of that is just to get you guys to really understand how to deal with ex laboratory setups and, and how to avoid potential error causing aspects of those laboratory setups. Okay. All right, so there's the periods for you to get working on. If you need any help, let me know. Remember that whenever you're doing these, your little toolbox is up here. On that toolbox, you have a, a protractor that's nicely already set you know, to be, to measure from the, the, from that vertical position, you got a horizontal ruler, you got a vertical ruler, you got a timer. And remember, you can start the, the, the simulation, you can pause it, you can advance frame by frame, and you can then reset the timer if you need to. You probably will whenever you actually measure the physical speed of the projectile to measure against your theoretical results. Um, so yeah. So those are the four tools that you have at your disposal for measurement. And you will just be given the masses of the block and the projectile. All right. Good luck. Have fun.